Live your life within the moment, moment. And don't go wait until the morning, morning. You never know when it is over, over. All that I know is we'll get older, older. So let us dance this side away. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Voices in Action, a podcast by Eastern Oregon Center for Independent Living. And before we begin, as always, please listen to the following important public service announcement from the late and honorable Judy Human. Judy is the former United States Assistant Secretary of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services in the Clinton administration and the former U.S. State Department Special Advisor for International Disability Rights in the Obama administration. Recently, Judy starred in the Netflix documentary Crip Camp. Hello, my name is Judy Human. I'm here today to encourage you to please take your COVID vaccine. And if you have friends and family that haven't, please encourage them also. COVID is to be taken seriously. In addition to taking the vaccine, please use other protective methods. Wear a mask, use gloves, and sanitize frequently. If you need additional information, and you live in Eastern Oregon, you can contact EOCIL. Thank you and protect yourselves and the community. Welcome everyone to Voices in Action, a podcast brought to you by Eastern Oregon Center for Independent Living, a global disability resource and advocacy center, where here we dive deep into the lived experiences of many individuals at the heart of policymaking, substance use, LGBTQI plus advocacy and support, and so much more. In each episode, where we'll explore personal stories from individuals that shed light on real-world impacts and how they shape the lives of those in our community. Join us as we get insights from those who've walked the path and are making strides. So stay tuned as we unravel the threads of policy and personal journey and discover how EOCIL is making a difference in the lives of people, one story at a time. Today, I'm speaking with Marcos, a longtime community member of mine. First met him when he walked into my office seeking harm reduction services, and now He's been in and out of detox and recovery and now is seeking a better life for himself. Uh, Marcos, thank you for being here with me and giving me your time today to kind of talk about your life and history. You're welcome on Ebador. I just want to say I'm so grateful that you um, pretty much saved my life. You know, on um, I started using addiction when I was 13 years old. Um, I had both parents uh, and I got raised in a, in a, not in a broken home. I got raised in a beautiful home. Um, but there was not a lot of love at home as well. You know, so I started getting involved in gangs on um, running the streets at a young age. I got convicted in a juvenile center in the Dallas, Oregon. Um, and I picked a, I got charged for a uh, concealed weapon at a young age. Um, I kept running the streets. And I was 15 when I got um, committed into the Dallas uh, Norco Facility Institutional. And then my life was great when I got out for a little bit and I started using again. Um, I did not complete school. I was a kid, disruptive kid in school. I never um, paid attention. Um, I was always ornery, always um, rebellion towards my family. Um, my mom worked as a social worker. My dad worked out in the agricultural field for multiple years till this day, he still does seven days out of the week, 14 hour shifts on, um, there was no love in the house as me and my dad really, really didn't have a really good connection growing up. So I started hanging around with the wrong crowd, started thinking that that's the way I wanted to live on um, at the age of uh, 18, I moved down to my house. I met my, my other half, which we had a kid together. I thought that it was going to be my whole entire life with her or whatever. So we got together, had a son, and I lived in Payette for a little bit. Um, I am from Ontario, Oregon, um, and my life was just in and out of jails and prisons, you know, for a long time. Yeah. Um, and I realized that my life was un terrible, you know, and um, I thought that that was going to be my whole entire life till, you know, whenever, you know, I, I was going to end, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. And there's a lot to dive into that. I kind of want to start off with just kind of getting an understanding of, of where you grew up. Uh, where were you born? Were you born in Ontario or I in was, Oregon? I was born in Ontario, Oregon, Malheur County. Yeah. 
Yes, I was born at the Holy Rosary there when it was Holy Rosary at the moment. Okay. Um, and did you grow up with like both parents being in the house or were they separated or? Yes, both parents were in the house on it's six siblings. I got three brothers, two sisters. Uh, my parents were together till I was till I was 19. My mom on um, there was verbal abuse in the house towards yeah. her. So, yeah. And I know you mentioned in your like quick little intro was kind of it was a beautiful home, but also not a lot of love in the home. Um, kind of what was going on? Did you just feel ousted or is it just a clash between your parents like some people do i know i clash with my dad every once in a while and some people it's a lot more severe where they have a falling out did you like experience any any like trauma from that household living there not receiving love or or what was that like growing up it was it was trauma you know on um, my dad really he was a really strict parent and he didn't show any kind of love sympathy right, i would say he would come home and he wouldn't give us the attention that uh, we wanted. So I sink the intention with my other friends that their parents let them, you know, do whatever they wanted. So it was more like that. It was more trauma, if I think. Yeah. And then what, what age did then did you start hanging around with the wrong crowd of people or that are getting in trouble? I started hanging around when I started at, uh, at the age of 13, man. 13. And what were you kind of getting into? Is it because you mentioned gang violence and stuff like that what what part so i started hanging out with the wrong crowd right um my neighbor was my best friend growing up you know and his dad was a his dad was an active gang member of a, of a gang and i just followed that trade you know just started hanging around with him started drinking using drugs because his parents accepted uh, let him do all that so i follow that pattern you know as a growing up as a kid you know and it just became a pattern, you know, on, I just didn't want to go to school. I skipped school, run the streets, you know, just did terrible things, you know, yeah. that, you know, thank God I'm still here till this day. Yeah. And what, what would, did you start off using? So my first drug was marijuana at the age of nine. That was, you know, when I was younger. Um, but at the age of 13, I started smoking meth, which it was called crank back in the day on um, by the age of uh um, that's really young to start using 13 starting using that yeah wow yeah i started using at a very young age on um, so my usage uh, briefly it wasn't a daily thing it was just whenever my friend would get it you know we would party on um, my addiction started getting heavily when i turned about 19 years old i was using constantly selling drugs on um, running the streets didn't care, you know, on um, getting in trouble in and out of prison in Idaho, in and out, in and out for the 10 years of all my 20s till I was 30. Wow. Um, when when what was the first time you got arrested and for what? I got arrested in 2005, back in 2005 in Oregon for uh, a theft one classy felony. I did about a year in county and then all my other was in Idaho. 2008, on. Um, I was in, I was already out of the system in 2013 in Oregon, but in 2008, I committed a burglary, but I did not get convicted until 2011. And I've been off paper for the last four years, Okay, you know, on, um, I didn't, I didn't finish all this till I was 30 years old, man. Wow. Yeah, no, that's, that's starting early then and getting into all that trouble. What, what did your parents think about that? Were you ever afraid that your parents would find you doing any of this stuff or how did they handle? So I, for the longest time through my 20s, I really didn't go around my family because they didn't accept who I was with. They never accepted my other half. You know, they never accepted the the the, the way I was living, um, what me and her were doing, stealing from stores and stuff like that. Or living a life of a, you know, just of a hopeless, hopeless person, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, man. And then how about your siblings? Did so, they have a hard time um, also with your parents or were you really close with that, either one of them? So I was really close with my brothers and sisters uh, when I was younger. Um, I'm not, not when I got into my 20s because they didn't accept my other half. So it was there was a separation there for a long time, but we still contacted each other. We still kept tabs, but it was never like on uh, family reunions anymore or nothing yeah. like that. So it became... Um, a far distance relationship with them for a long time and then did any of them ever show any concerns about you using or the people like did they ever mention it or bring it up in conversation that you should 
stop, that it's not good for you? So my mom would always tell me, hey, son, you know what? I know what you're doing. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not dumb. You know, I know what you're doing. My sister would always tell me, brother, I want you to change. We know what you're doing. And my brothers, too, all my siblings, they don't use or nothing. Um, so it was me, the only black sheep out of the family. You know, um, I realized that, you know, I, I, at that point, I didn't really care what they said. I really just thought that, you know, they didn't accept me for who I was or what I was doing. So I was just getting harder and harder in my addiction. But at the same time, I noticed that they did care, you know, and I noticed that that they just wanted the best for me. Yeah, no, definitely. And then kind of just keeping along with this chain is when you were using, was was it just to feel like one of the boys, like when you were hanging out with your friends, did you use because you they were using or was there using it because you were trying to hide something like either pain, either a lack of love and support from your family or what was the reasons that you started using so early? I think I was starting to use when I was younger because I didn't want to feel pain. I didn't want to feel no feelings or, or anything. So I started using and I kept using. I just wanted to be that kid that wanted to be accepted and that always wanted to get attention, seek attention, right? I found out that that's what I was doing. You know, I was always trying to make somebody else like to earn respect or anything. I had to do what I had to do, like fight, just run the streets and all that, you know, yeah. but at the same time, like, I was just seeking attention. I was just seeking uh, to be accepted for yeah. who I was. And did you ever ask anyone or talk to anyone about your your usage problem? Yes, it was with my other half. That's the only person that knew for the longest time. It was just, it became after multiple years of 18 years being with her. It became to like, I, I was okay with letting her know everything. Yeah. But not letting my family know everything, Okay. So it just became like that. So I really, really didn't share a lot of things with my family at the point because I didn't want them to hate me even worse or look at me different, which they already did for what I was doing, you know? Yeah. And then when you got incarcerated, did your other half stick with you through that or did you get any support from anyone else while you were in and out? So when I was in and out of out of prison, my dad never helped me out, right? He always told me like cold shoulder. But my mom always enabled my behavior growing up, always was there for me day and night, no matter what. She was always there. She always said, no matter what, I'm always going to be there for you, son. And on, so I thought it was OK. You know, I thought I was going to be fine in there. You know, I thought, that you know, no matter what, I was going to get commissary, no matter what, I was going to get my TV, no matter what. It, it was always being comfortable. Right. So, yeah, it came to a point where, like, she got tired of that. She got tired of enabling my behavior. So she's like, nope, I'm not doing this anymore. So then I started realizing like, oh man, this, then this, then this ain't for me being in prison, you know? And even in there, like I was still not following the rules. I was still using drugs. I was still running this, running up in there, the pinochle table, like just all the bad things that you could think of, you know, having access to, to pharmacy stuff and all that. So there were yeah. still things that I was doing in there that weren't the right things to do. Right. Yeah. I, I, I want to touch on that because we just had an interview um, with a, a radio news reporter and we were talking about kind of like the incarceration system and how people can still get whatever they want while they're in jail, while they're incarcerated. What can you kind of shine a light on to what, it, what was it that you saw in there and what could you get a hold of and how much did you use and how did you get away with using while you were in jail? So at the point of time, I got a hold of heroin, methamphetamine and weed. All within in jail? Yes, all within in jail and in prison. I got a hold of all these substances. Uh, I, I was making money, man. I was making a lot of money in there. I was selling a little pinch of heroin for 50 bucks, a little of uh, just a little pinch. Caps of weed were like 150 so I was still making more money in there than I would have been out here on the streets, you know, wow. and being able to send money out to the outside world was always a good thing, a good blessing, you know? Yeah, and how, how did that happen though? Like how, how were you exchanging money? Is it just all commentary so, money that you were? Changing? So it was street to street. So I would, you know, so somebody would link up with one of my friends out there and then they would link up and they would hand her, her the money or she would hand him the money and it was just all street street to street so i yeah. would make the phone call and be like hey meet up with this guy's wife and this is that that you know so it was it was just constantly no matter what my my books were never less than maybe a thousand dollars you know no less than that you know yeah. 
and and the, and then there would be times where like I wouldn't have anything, you know, and like I would be like, damn, you know, but I knew something would come through, you know, and like I said, like there's always ways to to be hustling all the time, like yeah. So like even just knowing that it's no difference. The only thing that's different about doing it out here and being in there is that you're behind a cell. That's it. Yeah. And being locked down, but there's there's anything you know you can get a hold of anything at the point you know yeah and it's wild because like we've been talked about how you go in there and it's basically a, a 101 on how to be a criminal you go in there with all these people who are, are violent offenders push substances and you come out knowing how to do everything wanting to do everything right i don't know if you feel comfortable how how are you getting stuff in there was it just you'd have people purposely get arrested go into jail with this stuff no um the thing is like so at the same time, like you would just like I would just get it like mailed to me or something or whatever, Mail, you just, know, like oh wow, just this, you know, just things like that. You there was other kind of ways, you know, understand. But at the same time, like I I would I would like when I knew that I was going up in there, I would know that I'm gonna load up. You know what I mean? I would take st- I would take it in there because, you know, I knew that that's where my money was gonna be. So I would take drugs into the facility as well. You know. So yeah. I'd be making money in there no matter what, so, so I could get for what I need, you know? Wow. And w- you were still a, a teenager when you first got into a juvenile detention center, right? Yeah. Was that still the same thing? Were you still being able to, like, bring stuff in uh, there? That, or in is... that time, it was more harder, man. There was no access to when you know, I was in a, ju- in a juvenile detention. All this happened when I was in a prison with adults. Because I knew that as soon as transport caught to county, I knew that I could take what I had with me and, you know, go up in there, you know, and make money. Right. Yeah. So there was, there was ways that I was doing it, you know, um, it's just, it's the same thing, you know, like I, I knew like just being in the game and all that and being in gangs, like I, I would be involved in whatever I wanted, you know? So, yeah. Wow. And then while you were in there in like the juvenile detention center or when you were in there as an adult, did any of the correction officers or any programs in there provide any help for quitting, going to rehab, furthering your education? Uh, I don't think you you shared on here, but you shared with me personally that you you didn't finish high school, yeah. right? So while you were in juvenile detention or, or incarcerated as an adult, did did they provide any services on how to um, get treatment, how to get your GED or life after jail or any services around that? So when I went through juvenile, there was no services like that. There was no treatment centers or there was no any kind of help. I was just doing day per day, you know, um, we would come out to do some couple classes or whatever, but then go back to ourselves. When I got to prison, there was kind of a little bit of programming, but it was more like fake it to make it, you know, and that's what I was doing every time to get out. I was just faking it to make it. There's yeah. MRT, ART, you know, all that. But at the same time, it's like you can get through it. You can you can just fake it to make it right. And that's what I did is that I faked it so many times because I knew how to do it every yeah. time to get out of prison. I knew it was going to be the same programming. It was going to be the same programming, role playing, all that. Like it was already in my head. Like I'm going to get these dudes to believe what I got to say. Right. Yeah. But when I came out through out to this world and I decided, you know, hey, it's time for me to make a change. I got sick and tired of being tired. I realized that I needed to talk to somebody. So I went to EOCIL and they they had an individual named Amador and he helped me um, get me help. And he got me into detox and he got me into the ability to show me that there is kind of hope and be successful in life. So like he is one of the best persons I could have been in front of my life growing, growing up and stuff through this addiction that I had, you know, because I know that this works if you work it, you know, and it works as long as you follow the patterns and as long as you have the ability to make that change. Yeah. So because nobody can walk the path besides you and, but there is people that can guide you. Yeah. And that's what there is out here. Okay. Yeah. And I want to thank you because, you know, you, you mentioned amateur that happens to be me. So thank you for that. I mean, it does mean a lot to know that, that you're doing a lot better. Um, and before we get into kind of that process, I do want to get into what life was like when you got into detox and what that process was like, because I haven't ever been through that. I was fortunate enough to be able to quit my addiction by myself. 
Uh, and I understand not everyone can do that. And I'm thankful that I was able to do that. But for some people who, who are curious or like kind of scared to get into those places, I want to dive into that. But just backtracking a little bit before that, the last time you were in jail, uh, did you already have your, your first child or? Yeah, I, yeah, so I had my child when I was 19, man. I had my child when I was 19, then that didn't change. I just kept going using drugs, man. I wasn't there. My dad's had custody of my son since he's been five years old, but he never gave up to me. He never gave up on me. No matter what, he still has hope. He still knows that dad's making a change. He knows that what I want. And that's my goal is to be a bilingual counselor on helping other individuals overcome addiction, right? Yeah. And like my story is is a story that I can relate because I've been through trauma. I've been homeless. I've been the one living underneath trees. I've been the one running in the rain or, or with, with backpacks and, and not showering and not self-caring about myself. I'm that person. I lived that life. I'm the one that was out, you know, you know, just running it, you know, like always asking people for money or always asking, like just other individuals for help, right? Yeah. Like to get my addiction, I was that person, man. I remember there was one time that I was in Ontario, Oregon, and I fell asleep outside a resting area right there entering Idaho. And 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 it was it was that me walking around with the backpack, not knowing where I was at, not knowing if I ever was gonna make it this far. Yeah knowing and having the ability to know that there is hope in life and that's where i'm at right now did you ever worry that you would overdose or that Um, your last hit would be it for you i would always worry that because i was an iv user for for a little while man Uh, i didn't start using iv till i hit 29 and stuff but i i just kept going you know i didn't care i wasn't scared to die but then i realized like that's what's gonna happen you know so yeah i came to realize that i needed help and and i'm and i'm thankful that eocil is the one that found me the help and they are people that do help people with addiction was there a specific moment like the lowest of lows that made it finally click in your head to walk into my office yes um so there i just got back from portland one day and on I went to my buddy's house and I just came back with multiple things on me, substance and on, and I told him like, I, it, it wasn't the same anymore. I felt like it had fentanyl in it. And I was just like, you know what, this ain't the life I want to live, bro. So I left everything there and, and they're like, well, we can't believe it. And I decided to make that, that choice right there at that moment is it's time for me to go. Yeah. It was October 30th. All right. So I went to my brother's house. I called you. I called Amador and Amador said, yeah, you know, so I went in there, got help. And uh, he found me a ride to detox and it was him transporting me. So like with me having the ability to say like, I made that change just because somebody helped me get there. Yeah. And I couldn't have done it without somebody helping. Yeah. And it's amazing because a lot of people don't think that they could do it on their own or afraid to reach out for help. And there's so many people out there willing to help. I remember when you walked into my office, I, I was ready because I always want to make sure that it's something you want to do. I don't want to make you do something that you're being forced to do. Uh, I can't make you quit even no matter how hard I try that has to come from you. So I always, and whenever someone wants to seek treatment, I have a talk with them. Like, is this something you want to do? Because if it is, I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure that you get the best help that you can. And, and within a few days of you coming to my office, I made a couple of phone calls, um, reached out to different places to see where I can get you into detox, where I can get you in a bed immediately after. And it, it took a little bit, but we got you in there really quickly. I even remember the day that we were going to be driving you up. And it's not something I normally do, but for like your case, I saw that you were committed. I saw that this was something that you needed in your life. So I made the phone calls. I got the car and we drove up. You even beat me to the office that day. I remember that you were out there waiting for me to show up to drive you to detox. And that, and that was an amazing thing. Um, and I ended up driving you all the way up to Pendleton um, at the EOFC to get you the help that you needed, which is, which is just great. Um, kind of before, just before we get into the detox portion, how did you end up hearing about us or or what made you call my office rather than someone else's? So I heard about EOCIL 
through health department because I was going there for on for harm reduction, you know, for the needle exchanges. And I told them like, hey, like, what do you, what, where can I get help? You know, I'm trying to get into rehab there. I go to EOCIL. There's yeah. a possibility that they can get you some help. Boom, I did it. I was out thriving. I was out thriving because I knew that I needed this. So I I got here, man. You know, I got, I came through detox. Yeah. And, and Well, I'm, I'm grateful that you did end up walking into our office and, and we'll wrap up to get you where you needed. So kind of now moving away from, your life here in Ontario, um, the stuff that you used, reaching out to us. When I first dropped you off and we were walking up to the detox center, um, walk me through how you were feeling when we pulled up to the doors. Were you nervous, excited? Were you scared of what was going to happen or if you were going to be able to make it through? So the thing was that I was, I was in my addiction still. I just got done doing, you know, some drugs before I went through detox. I remember we, we stopped at a gas station and I, and I did my thing and stuff. And I was just like, this is it right here, man. Like no more after this, this is done. You know, yeah. um, I wasn't scared. I was more like fear of dying. I was more like, like, why, why aren't, why isn't this happening to me? Why doesn't, you know, my higher power take me or whatever, you yeah. know? So I was realizing like, okay, then this is where he wants me. This is where he wants me today. He wants me to seek help. So I went in there with a lot of uh, with a lot of uh, integrity, like integrity, and a lot of commitment, knowing that I needed to make my mom smile. I needed to make my mom have that hope again. So I went in there with a lot of confidence, a lot of confidence. No matter what, I didn't look back, even yeah. though there was something telling me like you're doing the wrong thing, Marco. I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not doing the wrong thing. I'm doing the right thing for the right reason, and that's. Because I wanted to see my mom smile again yeah. and put a smile on her because I remember she told me, all I want is my son back. And I said, oh, you will get him back, mom. I know that's a beautiful thing. And, uh, and, and, and I went with it and I tried with it, even with my grandma always telling me, like, when I when I leave this world, I want you to be clean and sober. And, and you know what? And I tried with that because... I, you know, like there's an uncle that's serving 12 years, you know, and he's about to get out in two years. I want to be able to help him out. Yeah. I want to be able to be there for him. I want to be able to show him that there's hope in life besides living a, a life of a, of a, a hopeless, dopeless, you know, yeah. of, of a druggie, you know? So going through detox, I remember, I still remember because there was this, this sweet lady, her name is Frances, Francine. And, um, She's like, hey, she's like, hey, Marco, and whatever. And then on Amador left, and I was just like, you know what? I just want to bless that guy, man, because he's the one that saved me, you know? So then with that, on a couple of days in, I started feeling sick. I started really feeling sick, like, dang, like, is it this going to get any better? And, and, and it wasn't. Well, like my fifth day, I started feeling good. Yeah, I was like, "Whoa, this is this." I'm coming back. I'm starting to realize life. I'm starting to eat. I'm starting. So yeah, yeah all uh, the detox in your day, yeah. right? So ex explain that to me. So when you walk in there, do they ask you a bunch of questions, or do they yes. just place you in a room, or or how do they kind of watch you? So detox, they asked me what was my drug of choice. Why did I come here? Uh, and they asked me multiple questions like, "What are your, what are your, what are your goals? Yeah. What are your treatment like? What, what are your achievements after this? You know, because they thought I was gonna only be there for seven days, and I was like, you know what? Like, I want more than seven days. I want months. You know? Yeah. And they're like, all right, we'll get you into rehab. And I was up on the next call out to go to rehab after seven days. You know, and just it just felt so good to know how much people care about people that are in addiction yeah just having the 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 ability to know that you know no matter what like there's there's people out there and we think that we don't we don't have people out there but we do so the first days were you know they were sad but they were getting better yeah. the second day did they just place you like in a room or yeah or and they just watch you all day. What, what were you allowed to do? Did they make you do courses, classes, or anything? Or you just got to hang out there and just kind of detox? Detox is a place for on um, you to get your mental and, and mentality back on track. So you get to sleep all day. Uh, they feed you real good. Um, you could get to watch TV. You get your own room to yourself, own bed. 
everything, but they're just checking up on you constantly, making sure that that you're doing good, making sure if there's anything that they, that you want to talk to or want to talk about, you know? Yeah. So just being comfortable, knowing that I could be safe. Yeah. I was safe and I was saved at the same time. And did you feel all the people there? Yes, were absolutely. Caring or did you have any problems with anyone there? Absolutely not. Every person in that place is, is fabulous, man. Um, there was even individuals that were going through detox that I, I, I really, um, really looked out for, you know, um, yeah, just, just uh, the ability to know that, yeah, man, there's, there's hope. <laughs> yeah. And then how, how many days did you spend in detox? I spent seven days, seven days. So, okay. So you spent seven days detoxing, got all that out of your system. Um, you know, fortunately enough, we were able to get you to a bed right away. I remember that was like one of the first stipulations that when I called the place to get you to detox is I need him to get a bed after I don't want him to go to detox and then come back here, get into the same meet up with the same friends, get into the old habits. We need him to get into bed immediately. And luckily they were able to do that for you and, and put you ahead of the list, get you into a bed right away. Um, what was that transition like? Were you, were you nervous to be there? Cause you were going to be there for a couple months, right? Yeah. So, um, so the first time I went through there, I dealt with a lot of anger, right? A lot of resentment, a lot of, um, like, like just being mad at myself for what I've done and for what I, why did it take so long for me to meet the circumstances, you know, that I'm at, you know, like, why did it take so long for me to know that this is what I've been needing Yeah, was help. So I went through that program. Um, it wasn't easy. Like I said, there's, there's, you know, people that can vouch for me. Like I came a long ways in, in life, you know, being that individual that was a bully, that individual that was, had a lot of anger inside to breaking them down to knowing that, you know, um, to knowing that no matter what, the only person that can make that change is myself. And that's by me thriving. Yeah. That's by me keep on going to classes. I was going to on um, anger management. I was going breaking ba- breaking boundaries on um, spirituality, on um, grief, on um, what else? On um, talking uh, talking about lies, on um, yeah. honesty, you know, all those things, you know, on um, accountability, you know, on um, responsibility, on mm-hmm. um, helping other individuals yeah. you know I, at the same time like there was a, there was there was things that i learned through that program yeah. like and is that something that they made you do or relapse prevention those, or is that things that you ask for them no that, that, or you know, they make you do that yeah that's the thing like relapse prevention breaking boundaries on um, grief on um, telling lies on um, why 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 tell lies or something spirituality there was like nine classes that I took, you know, it wasn't easy. Like I said, there was times that I would get angry, you know, because there was people that were war storing or, or talking about, you know, um, just addiction, you know, or, or yeah. how they, you know, this and that. So it wasn't easy for me, but I overcame it. And I knew that the little things were the things that I needed to let go. Yeah. And did you take those classes every day or is it spread out through a week? Uh, five days out of the week, Monday through Friday, man. You did all those classes. Yes. In one day. Every, yeah. So how long? So kind of walk me through it from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep. What was, what did you do? What was your schedule? So in the mornings I would wake up, I'd make me some coffee or I, I would just go on a walk and start my day off, go eat breakfast, um, go to class, man. At eight thirty, go to class all the way till five. All the way till five. Yes. And then after that, you get free time to yourself. Could you leave the rehab facility? I, I, I cut hair every day, man. When I was there, I was just cutting, fading people up, man, making people feel good about themselves. You know, that's my passion too. I have that gift from God. You know, yeah. just you know, writing poems, writing a poetry. I always stayed, always stayed busy. You know. Yeah. On um, always helping out in the kitchen when they needed it, you know, on um, helping others in, in, in the facility. And this was, this was later on down the road after being there for a while. Yeah. It probably takes a while to get used yeah, to it. So and- it was like, maybe like the the second month of being there, then I started getting it, going to church, going to NA, going to AA, oh, oh, um, going to the rack, going, going, just doing everything that I could get out of the program. Yeah. And so explain to me how you were feeling once graduation day. Did did you ever worry that you weren't going to make it? Or did you um, ever have a, 
point in time while you're in there they're like i'm gonna quit i can't i need to get out of here so there's not one time that i thought about quitting because that was not in my vocabulary man that was not in my vocabulary at all i came to realize that i had a mental disorder and i needed to go see a physician so i got prescribed my medication if i would have known that i had a mental disorder four years ago i would be four years sober today but since like i i knew that i had a problem i knew that something was bugging me something was I was using substance to, to cope with, to, um, to cope with my, my mental disorder. Yeah. You know, it was a coping skill. Right. So with the, what, with my medication, like I'm overcoming a lot of things, like a lot of doors are opening for me and I just don't give up. I keep going forward. I keep, I keep reaching out for people. I keep even telling my friends that are still in active addiction. Hey man, like, yeah. I try to have faith. Mm -hmm. It's faith, power, and strength. If you don't have that, then they, then you don't feel like there's hope, yeah. right? The world gets pretty dark. Yeah, it quick. gets pretty dark. So, like, I let God ride. I, I let God drive my car because I know when I drive, I wreck. Yeah, and it doesn't end up good. It ends up jails, prisons, or or maybe even death. Yeah, you know. So just knowing that, like, through this program, I realized, like. They help me overcome yeah. my addiction, you know? And then did they also help you connect with Carrie? Yeah, or like I was seeing Carrie in there. Like okay. I was seeing Carrie on, a, on every Tuesday. Every Tuesday of every Tuesday of each month, I was seeing Carrie, man. And Carrie came about for me. She's a really good therapist. She has taught me a lot. She has taught me a lot, that lady. She has taught me a lot, man. I think that everything that she talks about is real yeah on um, just with the ability to know the only person that can walk your path is you marco yeah and and that's how i take it today like that's the only person that can walk my path is me nobody else yeah and that's a really big thing um i make sure to not force anyone whenever they're in my office don't force anything on them i don't don't necessarily offer them rehab right away just because Sometimes people will think that, oh my God, he's just trying to get me into rehab. He doesn't actually care what I'm feeling or what I'm going through. So I always try to make sure at least I know your name. I know where you're coming from and what you do. And then we'll, we'll start our conversation through that. We'll, we'll build a relationship. We'll become friends. I'll, I'll check in on you. I'll ask how your weekends are. And then through there, I'll understand more or less if, if you're ready for recovery or, or bring that up. So that way it's something you can think about. Because I know a lot of times when you tell someone, oh, you should, have you ever thought of rehab? They think, well, what do you know better than me? Or what do you know my problems, my struggles? Because I know if, for a fact, if someone asked me if they knew, I, I think I did a really good job by not letting anyone know that I used, besides my like close friends that I used with. But like, I would have been kind of mad if they were like, you should go into rehab. Like, what do you know about my life? You don't know anything about me. What makes so, you say, what makes you say that I need rehab? I'm trying to deal with my own demons. So, so yeah. So with that being understand, it's like, so what I, for myself, you know, it's, it's about sharing my experience, yeah, my addiction with other people, sharing what has helped for me, yeah, not forcing recovery on anybody, but sharing what has helped for me today, yeah, and what can help other individuals, you know, instead of pushing it down their throat, it's one day at a time. You yeah, know? because if you go and tell them, hey, you want to go into Rica, what the like you got to not break them down. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a Lego. Yeah. You know, you break down a Lego, you get down to the bottom of it. Right. Yeah. And it's exactly when you're talking to somebody. So you're like, hey, hey, dude. So let me let me share a little bit about myself. Yeah, man. I used to live this life. I used to be out on the streets, bro. I used to do all this, man. I used yeah. to be a gang member. I used to carry guns. I used to carry pounds of dope, pounds of heroin. I was that individual, bro. Yeah. Like I went to prison 10 years in and out, you know, I lived on the streets, bro. Like, you know, like I know that there's hope because it helps me today. Yeah, for sure. So now talk to me on graduation day. How, how, how were you feeling? Were you nervous the days before? Uh, Excited to buy me? I was scared. Scared? I was scared because they say through the program, if you're not scared when you leave, then you haven't made growth. I was scared on leaving the place. Yeah. Because I was safe. Mm -hmm. I was okay with being there because I was saved. Yeah. Right. The real story starts when I left the place. And you know what? I knew that I was going to have the ability 
to show my family how I felt and for me to share my 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 story with them was a big thing because my mom knew what I've been through yeah my uncle was there after serving 15 years and he started crying because he knew that the life that I did was not what the Marco that they seen in that room that yeah. day. That day. So you had your family show up. Oh, on that 45 day. people there. That's amazing. Yeah, I know. I try to show up. I <laughs> desperately try to show up. Man, yeah. Schedule didn't work out, but I did. I was rooting for you. I wanted to be there and support for you. How how was your family treating you while you were in there? Like, did you keep in contact with I them? Did the, they change their opinion about who Marco's was? They said, Marco, we are so proud of you. The day that I graduated, my mom cried when we left. And she said, Marco, I knew that God answered my prayer. Yeah. My grandma, same thing. My cousin, my uncle, everybody. The ability to know that I have that back in my family today yeah. is I will refuse to lose that over anything. Yeah. I don't care what it is because it's my life. Yeah. Yeah nobody else's it's my life my higher power my life my recovery and my higher power today and that's how i run today because i got every single member of my family back in my life and my son my son was the biggest thing because he said so dad i never gave up on you i knew that you could do it and i'm gonna be there right next to you yeah so with that like what else do i want you know um i don't look back Amador, because there's a dark hole back there. Yeah. He's shouting for anybody, but not today. Yeah. And I tell that myself every morning, not today. Mm, that's because amazing. what God has done for me today is to be somewhere where I always wanted, where he always wanted me to be. Yeah. And that's for me to save people's souls. That's beautiful, man. So now you graduated, you had your whole ceremony. What's next for Marco? What, what do you plan on doing? What are your goals, your aspirations? So my goals and my aspirations is on giving back to the community, helping other individuals that suffer from addiction, on um, help the harm reduction, help E-O-C-I-L, you know, help them with, with, their, uh, with their ability to just be there for others, you know, yeah. just listening to people, you know, being there, sitting there, just hearing them out because that's what people need yeah. is for somebody to listen to them and just relate to them you know somebody that's been in there somebody that's been in their same shoes because you can't hire somebody that's a normie or somebody that's never worked in the field yeah you know so why not give the people that have experience that have the ability to like one of us you yeah. know that we can give back because somebody can be like hey man i've been a prisoner hey dude I, you know i'm i'm on this side i'm no way different than you are yeah but i've been in there but let's get through this, man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's, that's like one of the biggest things that we do here for like the work that I do is, is having peers, having people who've been through the struggle, have been drugged through the same mud that others are being drugged through. Right. Um, I, I struggle with addiction and it wasn't something I ever shared with anyone. And then I got this job and I realized that the power that, you know, my story uh, and my personal experience has on others. The fact that um, when you look at me, a lot of people would never, Thought it would have never thought that I, I had a drug issue. Even in high school, no one, none of my high school friends knew that I used. But being able to share that with someone else who again has this deep love for their family, this I can share that story with them, be like, hey, um, I haven't used since. I still have the the times where I want to use where I get into these points, but understand that there's people, if you reach out for help, they're going to help you. Um, I didn't judge you when you walked in. I didn't think like, oh, there's another freaking junkie here trying to get help. He's probably not gonna make it. No, I I allowed myself to be like, he needs help. I'm going to give it my all to make sure you get help. So that's amazing, man. And and having people that look like us yeah. be out there talking with them, treating them like humans first and foremost, because that's all we are at the end of the day. We're all human. I will never diminish you for the things that you have done. I will judge you based on the person you are today, the person that I know and speak on. And the more because I know now, I'm so happy to hear that you've gone through this entire journey um, has there been any time as of recently that 
you kind of want to slip back or have you no. had any struggles or are you been strong? So absolutely. My foundation is so strong that I don't have the ability to urge or cravings to go back to that. Yeah. Because I know what that does. My driving is going to meetings, going to AA, NA, OO, church, anything that has to do with recovery, I'm there. Yeah. Because that's what helps me today. And that's what saves me one day at a time. Waking up every morning and saying, God, thank you for giving me a blessing day. Let's rock and roll today. And today's going to be a better day than yesterday. Yeah. And just go with it. Right. I don't think about things. I don't think about, str- I don't stress because I know my life is great today where it's at. Right. And just coming into these kind of places with you guys really tried me because that's where God wants me. Yeah. It's like, God wants me all up in this field. And yeah. there's a reason why. Yeah. You know, like there's something that tells me like, hey, Marco, apply. Hey, Marco, go. Yeah. Like, let's do this, bro. Because there's people out there that don't know how to come in here because there's no Hispanics, bro. Yeah. And, and that's very true. Uh, we get a lot of people who come in, who who come in for like the food pantry and they only speak Spanish and they're kind of nervous. But as soon as I can, I let them know that I can speak Spanish yeah. with them. They're like, oh, okay, well, like, can you help me with this? And they're yeah. like, oh, absolutely. If I didn't, we didn't have anyone who spoke Spanish in my office. We would lose out on so many people on, on helping them, on getting them the food mm-hmm. that they need, getting them the recovery, the services for whatever it might be. So I definitely understand that part of, you know, we need people like us who are bilingual, who, who look like the community that we serve and helping them. Yeah. For right. sure, man. So it's it's absolutely amazing. If you could say anything to someone thinking about recovery or if they're scared of recovery or going to like a rehab, what would you tell them? I would say, hey, man, um, I would say, hey, man, you know, I, I feel that being scared is okay. Yeah. But if you don't reach out, you can't get the help you want. If you come in through rehab, you're going to get the help. And that's by going. That's by going forward in your recovery, by helping them get to the next step. Yeah. Getting closer to getting to the next step, right? And that's what helps is if they're scared, they're on the right path because I wasn't scared. I was more nervous Yeah, of not making it. If you're scared, then you need to be there. Yeah. You know, that's, then you need to be there. Yeah. Right. And you got to give yourself the ability, that chance to get help. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and then, so kind of, um, if you had the opportunity to meet yourself uh, when you were younger, before you started to get into this, what's the, a piece of advice you would give yourself, you know, outside of just don't do this, don't do that. What, what advice either that you would share with him or hope that he knows and understands my son you like if you got to meet yourself in the in the past if, if you can talk to yourself well what, what what is something that you would tell him that why didn't i do this a long time ago that why did it take so long for me to figure it out yeah yeah and then now how about do you want to like say anything to your family who who uh, hopefully will listen to this and kind of hear a little bit? I'm sure you you shared your story with them and they probably know, but um, like I just want to say, I just I just want to say thank you for my mom for accepting me for who I am today. Thank you to my brothers, Omar, Miguel, Juvi, Talia, Lupita. I just want to say I love them and I know that I made a change in my life today. And I know that I'm willing to go for the stars and to overcome my my addiction as well and, like, help other individuals overcome addiction as well. You know, you guys are the most beautiful things that I have in my family. Mom, um, just want to say that you don't have to see your son ever in addiction ever again on um, because I will take it one day at a time. I just want to say, Dad, I love you for always accepting me for who I was, you know, even though I wasn't a perfect son. And I know that I wasn't the best father, but I just want to say I love you, son. And that no matter what, you got to keep going forward and just know that your dad has made a change in his life and is willing to show you that as well. 
So I just want to say one more thing is thank you, Amador, for helping me out, get where I'm at in life and keep helping others, man, because it works if you work it, you know, because you're worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Marco. I, I really do appreciate you um, being vulnerable, sharing your story and and your experience through this. I know it's not easy and some people have a hard time reliving it or retelling their past or, or ashamed of themselves. Um, I know I'm I'm ashamed of myself sometimes when I have to talk about my substance use because it was such a dark place that I was in. So I, I really do thank you for giving me the time um, to meet me here in Pendleton. I, I drove all the way out here from Ontario to have this opportunity to talk with you because I wanted to talk with you. I wanted to share your story. Um, and I think it's really valuable that we hear from people like you who've gone through these ups and downs just because it's not easy for everyone. Um, I, I just want to take a quick moment to share a story. You know, how amazing Marcos is, um, the fact that he was able to seek help, he got help, he's doing better now and he's looking to better his life as being as a peer mentor, helping people who've gone through the same stuff. There's people out there that don't necessarily make it and not everyone can make it like Marcos did. And if you're ever worried, scared about it, come speak to us. If you want to get connected with Marcos, I, I'm sure we can make that happen. Um, we stay in contact all the time. And if you want to have someone to talk to, reach out to us. And it really does mean a lot. And uh, Marcos, thank you again. I'm, I'm happy I get to see you today. I'm happy I can call you whenever I want. I know that you're doing well. Um, it really does mean a lot. So thank you everyone to, for listening. This has been Voices in Action, a podcast by Asian Oregon Center for Independent Living. Thank you everyone for tuning in to today's episode. And I hope you enjoyed the conversation that I had with Marcos. And as always, if you have any questions about any of the material or content that we covered, I encourage you all to check us out online at www.eocil.org or interact with us on any one of our various social media platforms. We do have four office locations spread out through Eastern Oregon, one located in the Dalles, Pendleton, La Grande, and Ontario. And this episode is dedicated to a community member of ours that recently passed, and it's because of him that we do the work that we do and try to get the people the help that they need when they need it. Thank you. This, again, has been Voices in Action. Said a word, but it doesn't matter.